So at Defenders, we celebrate the National Wildlife Refuge System every day, all day, um, especially given its increasing role in addressing the biodiversity crisis, which is escalating uh, right before us. Uh, uh, it's uh, incredibly important to supporting wildlife conservation throughout the country. And it's increasingly important, the refuge system is increasingly important for people as well. What we also know, we didn't need the poll to tell us this, but what we also know, those of us that are working, and there's many of us on this phone today working on behalf of the refuge system, is that there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that the refuge system continues to fulfill its promise. As we face a growing biodiversity crisis and the impacts of climate change are increasing, protecting and expanding the refuge system will further an existing and hugely successful conservation model. Can you tell I'm biased? Um, so roughly one third, I believe that number is growing, but at least one third of federally listed endangered species rely on the refuge system just to survive and thrive. There's at least one wildlife refuge in every state throughout the country, and nearly all major cities are located within an hour's drive of a, ref a refuge, putting nature within reach of millions and millions and millions of people nationwide. Refuges are anchors for biodiversity <laughs> across the United States are an incredible, not only outdoor classrooms, but they're an incredible gateway to nature for nearby communities. Despite all the benefits that are undeniable for the refuge system, wildlife refuges are in trouble. The system is severely understaffed, it's grossly underfunded, and a growing backlog of repairs, lack of law enforcement to prevent poaching, and loss of over a thousand refuge staff has severely undermined the Fish and Wildlife Service's ability to fulfill the refuge mission. At Defenders, along with a lot of our partners, we are fighting to defend and protect what we have, as well as to expand these unique landscapes for conservation and for future generation. The work you're gonna be hearing about today is aimed at helping us all better understand public opinion about wildlife refuges, especially current public opinion, particularly after what we've been going through the last few years, so that we can be more strategic and impactful in our work to pr protect and expand these special places. To share what we've learned, I'm joined today by Fairbank, Maslin, Mullen, Metz and Associates, Miranda Everett and David Metz, and Newbridge Strategies, Lori Weigel, who led this survey and will walk us through the findings. At the end of the briefing, as, as Rachel shared, there's going to be an opportunity to ask questions and ac access a fact sheet that has all the key takeaway messages that you'll have at your disposal and can use uh, in your own work. So first, big thanks to my colleagues for kicking and getting this underway, uh, our refuge team, and big thanks to Miranda, Dave, and Lori for supporting Defenders in our work. And so with that, I will turn it over to you and look forward to watching the briefing. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie and, and Rachel. And I think we're going to put the slides up on the screen here in uh, just a moment. Uh, I'm Dave Metz with FM3 Research, uh, one of the two polling firms uh, involved here. You'll hear from my colleague, Miranda Everett, in a moment, and then Lori Weigel from Newbridge Strategy. The reason there are two polling firms involved in this project is we represent a bipartisan team. Uh, our firm, FM3, when we poll in partisan races, only polls for Democrats. Uh, Lori's firm, NBS, when they poll in partisan races, only polls for Republicans. But our two firms have been working in partnership for about two decades now, um, doing bipartisan research that sort of reflects the thinking of both parties and both its design and analysis to understand where the public is on critical issues, including many relating to conservation and the environment. Um, and we're very pleased today to talk about um, what uh, Americans in key regions of the country think about the wildlife refuge system. Um, overall, the results I think are enormously encouraging. They uh, show that the public believes that we need to be doing more to help and support wildlife across the country. Um, they strongly support a significant uh, uh, annual investment of $1.5 billion in strengthening uh, the wildlife refuge system. Um, and uh, we also uh, discovered a number of uh, key messages and themes that are very helpful in, in talking about this issue and connecting with the public and the things that they uh, appreciate so much about having healthy and robust populations of wildlife uh, in the country. So I'm gonna briefly talk through the methodology of the research and then I'll hand it over to Miranda and Lori to talk a little bit more about some of the key findings. 
On the next slide, you'll see a, a big summary of what we did here. And it was a, a multi-phase research project, um, which included both qualitative and quantitative components. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, there we go. Um, we started out by having some open-ended conversations with voters in key parts of the country. You'll see them summarized on the lower two lines of this slide. This included an in-person focus group in Cheyenne, Wyoming, as well as some online discussion boards with participants from Southern California, Florida, and across the Intermountain West. Um, those were held in early fall, and then they were followed up by an online voter survey that we conducted with a little over 200 voters in each of those three key regions. Um, with margins of error that you'll see uh, detailed on the slide here. And just to give you some orientation for exactly where it is we're talking about, you'll see on the next slide these regions highlighted. Um, again, both the online uh, discussion boards that we held and then the survey itself um, were with voters that, that are in these three locations. Um, I will note that while this is not the entire country, um, we capture an enormous amount of diversity, both in terms of political viewpoints, in terms of uh, racial and ethnic background, social and economic uh, diversity, um, and obviously folks in locations that range from densely urban to very rural. So um, these regions themselves, I think, capture a lot of the diversity that we see among the American electorate as a whole. So with that, I will hand it over to my colleague Miranda to start talking a little bit about what we learned. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we started big picture with some uh, sense of the broader issue context we're operating in here. Next slide, please. And this began with the classic pollster question, are things headed in the right direction or are they off on the wrong track? And you can see here we have three pie charts, one for each region. Uh, pessimism sort of abounds, um, which is not uncommon in a lot of our opinion research these days. Um, kind of under the hood there, there's a, there's a lot of concerns about cost of living and, and a variety of other concerns. Um, but you do see a little bit of difference here where Californians are a bit more pessimistic or, or mixed, whereas those in the Intermountain West region um, are slightly more positive as well as Floridians. Um, but the big takeaway here, and it's consistent with a lot of uh, current opinion research, is uh, folks are, are generally a little more pessimistic than optimistic. Next slide, please. So in the qual boards, and you'll you'll see the, the little person on a computer in the corner there to indicate findings that are relevant to that uh, research tool that we used, um, we asked people to kind of talk open-ended ways about nature and what it means to them. A lot of these folks told us that nature is really critical to their, their quality of life. And, you know, we were drawing from the Intermountain West, which, you know, that's that's key to their identity there. But the same was true in Florida and Southern California. Um, people talked about nature and proximity to it as being what they really value about where they live, whether that means they're, you know, hunting and fishing and taking their grandchildren to, to camp and, and things like that, or just having mountains in their backyard. Um, things as simple as that, it's really critical to them. When we talked about particular species, people mentioned their, their favorite animals. Um, some were really specific. Um, in Arizona, people talked about Gila monsters and javelinas. In Florida, they talked about manatees and sandhill cranes. Um, people really kind of identified with the, the local nature as well. We asked them about kind of what nature brings to their quality of life. So, you know, earlier we saw generally they're pessimistic, but nature um, is something they saw as critical. It's, you know, it's our home. It's the home of these animals they really care about and empathize with. Um, and it's a valuable place for peace and respite. A lot of people used words that were very sort of, um, you know, spiritual in a, in a sense. They talked about grounding and connecting. Um, that, that value of nature for its own sake is, is really clear to them. And people really understood the value um, of, of the ecosystem. They, under, they kind of understood the interconnected the interconnectedness of nature. And we see in some other results we'll show you in a bit how, how that kind of messaging about the, the broader web of life is something that, that really connects with folks. On this slide, you could see quotes as well, direct quotes taken from some of the folks in the groups, which we thought were uh, pretty interesting as well. Next slide, please. So turning back to the survey results, uh, we asked people about kind of their own relationships with nature and, and outdoor spaces. Um, a significant minority here uh, hunt or fish, have a license to do so. Um, men in Intermountain West residents, rural residents, were also more likely to be hunters and anglers, unsurprisingly. Um, but for most folks, folks, they don't have that relationship to nature. 69% said they're not licensed to hunt or fish. Um, so the kind of sportsmen uh, uh, traditionally, um, that's a minority, but a, a fairly significant one and, and more overrepresented over in that Intermountain West region and the rural places in our country. 
Uh, next slide, please. So the other ways that people kind of get outside and enjoy the outdoors, um, you know, it, it kind of ranges from wildlife viewing, 71% say they do that at least occasionally, 64% hike at least occasionally, 25% say they do that frequently in these regions, and then things like bird watching and camping, a little less common, a little less frequent uh, for some of those folks, but you can see a variety of op opportunities that people are getting out there at least, you know, every so often um, in these regions. Uh, next slide, please. So getting under the hood a little bit with the demographics of these, we see wildlife viewing is really common in every region. Um, you know, three and five or more say they do it at least occasionally. Um, but hiking is a little more common in the West, perhaps unsurprisingly. 77% of, of folks in the Intermountain region saying they do that at least occasionally, and two-thirds in Southern California. A little less common in Florida, but still majorities uh, are doing that. And then camping, also very common in the Intermountain West, 60% saying they do that at least occasionally. And this really lines up with uh, other research we do on this kind of issue in that region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so another task we had was to just kind of take the temperature, hear how people feel about wildlife, the value it brings to their life, um, particular species, or, or how they can kind of conceptualize what's important to them. Um, and on the next slide, you'll you'll start to see how we uh, got into that issue with them. Um, so in the qual boards um, and in the survey, we asked people about, you know, what is the most important species to protect or conserve? Here you can see some answers from the surveys and they really run the gamut. All wildlife has value, um, or some folks say, I want the endangered and, and native ones to be a, a priority. Um, some people talking about pollinators and honeybees, which is something we've seen increasingly um, salient in, in research across the country. Um, and the, some you can kind of tell which, which region they're hailing from, um, marine mammals, uh, things like that. And then other folks being a little bit cheeky with their answers and saying the ones that aren't delicious or anyone but mosquitoes. Um, so here you can see, you know, a variety of people thinking of things in categories of thinking of animals that are at risk or especially um, you know, they feel especially responsible for because they're native or, or endangered. And then specific kind of, you know, often charismatic macrofauna, um, coyotes, mountain goats, sheep, uh, things like that. So really running across the board when we talk about what comes to mind as, as needing protection and conservation. Next slide, please. So in the survey, we asked people to kind of step back and mo more broadly think, would you say more needs to be done to help wildlife in your state? Um, or is enough being done? Uh, here we see 49% say more needs to be done, plurality, um, and pretty strongly. Fewer uh, than, than uh, fewer say enough is being done than say, oh, I don't know, I'm a little mixed, um, relatively small group there. Um, in Florida, it was a smidgen higher, 52% think more should be done, and 54% in Southern California. Um, that figure is 40% in the Intermountain West. That's There's some kind of demographic differences going on there. And I think in the focus group in Cheyenne in particular, some light was shed on that where folks feel like they are surrounded by public land, um, lots of open space, undeveloped areas. Um, and, and so they kind of have the sense generally that, um, that, that there's places for wildlife to be. But when we probe on it a bit more, you'll see that there's um, really specific and, and strong support for refuges. Um, coexisting with this opinion. So next slide, please. So we asked people about kind of threats to wildlife. Um, what, you know, what's the biggest challenges that, that wildlife are facing from the survey? Um, and at the top of the list, we have this uh, kind of ranked by the combination of, of those seeing it as a major or a minor threat. So 90%, so just about everybody, say air and water pollution is a major or at least minor threat to wildlife. 88%, nearly as many, saying the same of development of housing and retail, real sense that kind of um, suburbanization or, or, or kind of exurbs and, and unchecked growth is uh, harming wildlife. Um, that was pretty broadly shared. And you can see the share who call that a major threat is three and five or higher for each of those. And sort of a second tier here in terms of intensity, we see diseases and pests, 46% saying that's a major threat, but nearly 90 saying it's at least a minor threat. Oil and gas development, 71% seeing that as major or minor, and nearly half seeing that as a major threat. Um, there's a little more sort of partisan dimension on that one. 
climate change, a majority seeing that as a major threat, 66% major or minor, again, sort of a, a partisan dimension in this one. And then farming and ranching, um, kind of in the relative ranking of the list, are, are much less likely to be seen as a major threat, um, just one quarter or fewer. Um, although, you know, significant shares see it at least as a minor threat. Um, that was something also in the qualitative that we saw people didn't quite understand the um, connection there. It's much more clear when we're talking about air and water pollution in terms of what they can kind of picture as a threat to, to wildlife. Next slide, please. So there are some regional dimensions on some of this stuff too. Um, climate change is definitely seen as more of a concern in Southern California. That's a region that is more democratic generally, so it kind of lines up there. Diseases and pests really stood out to those folks and ranching stood out to them just a bit more than folks in other regions. Otherwise, Floridians and Intermountain West voters have the same sort of relative ranking of, of the threats that they see to wildlife. Next slide, please. So again, I mentioned those partisan dimensions, and you can see they are very stark when it comes to climate change and oil and gas development. 96% of Democrats see climate change as a threat to wildlife, a major threat to wildlife, whereas just 11% of Republicans do. And independents are in the middle there, 39%. Similar pattern with oil and gas development, although not quite as pronounced, it's still quite substantial. 87% of Democrats seeing it as a major threat. 17% of Republicans saying the same. Um, and then in other places, you just generally see that Democrats are, are more concerned about a variety of these threats. Their, their level of concern is higher across the board. And then independents sort of hang out in the middle there with a lot of these concerns. Uh, next slide, please. So turning to views of the wildlife refuge system more specifically, we had some questions kind of identifying what they know about the system, kind of educating them about what it does more generally and digging into the benefits that they value the most, which I'll show starting on the next slide. So in the online discussion group, we had people kind of brainstorm. When you see or hear the word refuge, what comes to mind for you? Um, a lot of people thought about safety, a safe place. Um, we had not cued them to think about wildlife refuges specifically at this point in the discussion. Um, so some people were thinking about humans escaping difficulty, but I think the thing that kind of really shown through is that um, safety is the key here. A refuge is a place where someone can have peace, safety, not be bothered, you know, live on their own um, and, and maybe escape um, some other threat. So that's, that's the kind of what that word means to people in isolation. Next slide, please. So here you can see the sort of central uh, question in the survey, which was really about the investment in the wildlife refuge system. We provided some context for people here. You can see at the top of the slide here in the blue box, there's 567 of these nationwide. Um, kind of what makes them unique? They're set aside primarily for conservation and secondarily for recreation. Um, it provides access to a lot of outdoor activities, um, and they're managed by USF. WS. Um, we asked people if they support or oppose investing $1.5 billion annually into maintaining and modestly expanding these refuges. Um, we thought it was important to, to kind of put a dollar figure on it to get that kind of reality check because we know people have a lot of competing priorities these days and um, having that number in the mix gives us a realistic look at people's willingness. And here we see, as Dave mentioned, this is, you know, overwhelmingly positive. 80% support this uh, proposal, 48% strongly suppose it, oppose support it, <laughs> sorry, and just 14% uh, oppose it. So very, very, very broad support and very strong support as well for this kind of key proposal from the survey in these regions. Next slide, please. So one thing we did, of course, is break this down by major demographic groups in our three regions. Um, of course, party does have an influence here, but the support is extremely broad, even among uh, uh, Republicans who are typically more skeptical of kind of federal spending and things like that. 95% support from Democrats, 7 in 10 strong support, really remarkable there. Independents, 80% support with them, just 12% opposed. And then almost two thirds of Republicans also support this uh, proposal. So incredibly broad uh, bipartisan support for this uh, proposal. Another kind of key demographic in these regions is uh, race and ethnicity, and we see that voters of color are particularly supportive. 85% of them support this investment proposal that we provided, uh, whereas the same, you know, similar pattern, but a little 
tiny bit muted with uh, white voters where, where three quarters uh, support it, which is still um, fantastically broad. Uh, next slide, please. So as you, as you saw earlier, we had looked at people's kind of relationships with the outdoors, thinking that might have some influence on how they feel about these issues, of course. Hunters and anglers, um, really broadly supportive here. Uh, two thirds of hunters support the proposal. Three quarters of anglers support the proposal. Those without a license to hunt or fish, 82% support it. So um, really the big takeaway is a, a kind of across the board support. And then the people who said they frequently participate in, in that list of outdoor activities that included camping, bird watching, hiking, um, and wildlife viewing. Those folks are a little more likely to support it, um, strong, strongly supported by a majority of those folks. But even those who don't frequently get outside personally and, and engage in those activities are still supportive. So, you know, some of the people who who kind of benefit the most from having those places to, to maybe recreate um, are a little more tied in, but even those who um, don't have so much to gain personally um, still really broadly support it in principle. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, of course, by region, it's important to look at the breakdowns. Um, you know, it's really consistent across these three regions, despite their differences in partisanship and urban rural and all sorts of things. The takeaway is that 80% or just or just near uh, support the proposal in the three regions we looked at. Majorities do so in Florida and close to majorities do in Southern California and the Intermountain West. So really broad support geographically in these three key regions. And then we'll look, when we look at it by people's kind of self-described sense of whether they live in a small town, rural, uh, suburban, or city environment, um, city dwellers are especially supportive, 86%. Um, but even our, our kind of suburban and rural folks um, are, are really broadly supportive, two thirds or, or three quarters or more uh, support the proposal there. Uh, next slide, please. By gender and by age, again, support is very broad. Um, women slightly more supportive, which is often uh, typical when we think about kind of environmental issues and things like that, um, but really broad support across the board there. And then by those two kind of major breakouts of age, we see you know, statistically no real difference with older voters being a little stronger in their backing for the proposal. Uh, next slide, please. So we asked supporters of the proposal to tell us in an open-ended way, they could type it in on the survey, uh, why do you support this proposal? What's kind of motivating you here? And you can see the responses really ran the gamut when we categorized them. A lot of people said about a quarter mentioned something to do with you know, the central mission, protecting habitat, protecting wildlife, protecting animals. That's that's key, they understand that and they value it. And they, they kind of said that back to us. 17% um, sort of the second ranking response was about that that concept of ecology and in the in the broader sense of nature and connectedness. So people kind of stepping back a little bit and saying that's something they value. Um, other people talking about you know a range of other uh, benefits that they see in the proposal: biodiversity, uh, future generations need this kind of access. Just our responsibility as human beings to sort of steward um, nature and care for it. Um, other people mentioning, you know, once an ecosystem or an environment is, is changed, you really can't get it back or it takes a lot of work to do so. Um, and then, you know, lots of other uh, things here, just kind of, it's important to do, it's good for the world, more general responses that were also in the mix as well. Next slide, please. And here you can feel see a few kind of uh, characteristic responses we selected of the hundreds we looked at. Um, you know, we, we need to do more to protect and conserve habitats before they collapse. We need to maintain some habitats that we're displacing. Um, you know, humans will, will eliminate everything if we don't keep ourselves in check. Um, other people talking about respect for God's living beings. Um, so a variety of rationales here, but I think the common thread is really an understanding of that responsibility um, and that value that, that people really understand, um, as well as a lot of people talking about the threats that they see. So I'll hand it over to uh, Lori to talk through some of the findings we uh, found with uh, our messaging themes and how to talk to people about this important issue. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Miranda. Um, 
So we also tested messages and I think um, <laughs> you're sort of picking up a theme here. I love the idea of uh, the top message that ended up being the most compelling uh, for the folks that we talked to in these three key re regions. Um, I often liken it to Disney's The Lion King, The Circle of Life song, <laughs> but we called it the Jenga effect here. And it's basically the same concept that any one piece in the puzzle is incredibly important. And that, um, and I won't read the entire message there, but the idea was that we gave them this idea that if you pull out too many pieces, eventually the structure is going to collapse, whether that's coral reefs or whether that's um, places that animals rely on for food or spawning grounds or whatever that might be, that everything is sort of connected. And um, half of respondents told us that that was a very convincing message in order to support this proposal to invest $1.5 billion annually in federal funding. So um, Usually what we're typically looking for is something that's in that 35 to 40%. All of the messages on this page hit that mark or even higher. Um, the second one really talking about um, protecting those iconic and threatened species and their habitats and where refuges are able to protect thousands of species from these threats. Um, and then finally, the idea that um, that we need to conserve more, essentially, sort of evoking the 30 by 30 proposal and telling them that these new refuges are lands that would be dedicated specifically for the purpose of wildlife conservation. So all of these really are incredibly compelling rationales. And I think uh, if you move forward two slides, um, I think it really was underscored in what we heard from respondents in both the focus group and in the online focus group across the regions. I mean, people tell us that wildlife are sort of the backbone of life. They often refer to this idea of a natural balance. It's something we've heard before in other research um, and really helping to ensure or restore natural balance is just those are words that they use and that idea of balance is really important. Moreover, they liken wildlife to sort of the canary in a coal mine for humans and tell us that if wildlife are unhealthy or they're threatened, potentially that's going to affect humans as well. And whether that's pollution, whether that's climate change, whatever that threat is, they connect it to people. <laughs> and obviously they care about people too, um, not just wildlife. Um, we had a small proportion that said, hey, the benefits of wildlife also are connected to, um, to tourism, to visitation, to say the outdoor recreation economy. That can really vary. And certainly that can be incredibly important in very specific local communities as well. But that was, uh, that was a more minor theme um, across what we heard. And then finally, um, when thinking about the threats to wildlife, I'd say people is sort of the catch-all <laughs> that they think of, um, but the most visible and the most common that they mention is sprawl and development. It's something they can see. They often talk about how we're kind of invading wildlife space, um, and so that's very common. Littering, uh, people sort of uh, invading wildlife space is another idea. Air and water pollution, like I just mentioned, or climate change, or even unfortunately being hit by cars. That's why we often see like overpasses and underpasses and other work that we do often being really um, something that connects with people because it's just another visible negative effect on wildlife that they can see sometimes when driving, especially in the Intermountain West. We've heard a lot about that. Um, so we heard a lot in the qualitative research and on the next slide, we wanted to make sure and test some of the benefits that they perceive um, potential benefits from wildlife refuges. Um, now, I will say that in looking at all this data, it's very consistent with what we've seen in talking about um, sort of land conservation in general. Water tops the list. People say water is integral. We have to have it. Wildlife have to have it. People have to have it. And so protecting water quality is just sort of dominates and blows everybody away in terms of all the other attributes with three quarters rating it as extremely important and more than nine in 10 saying it's either extremely or very important. Um, 
But beyond that, uh, we will we'll often see when we talk about land conservation, just wildlife in general is an important attribute. We dug into that obviously a little bit more here, but just habitat itself is something that resonates, also protecting species that are at risk of extinction. And then the, the fourth one here, protecting iconic species, we actually split the sample in half. Half heard these two examples, We'll see the next one in just a second on the next page. It was just a tick down from that, but those bison and bald eagles compared to the top of this. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel, it's fine. And to the top of this list was iconic species such as wolves and grizzly bears. So just slightly below, I even double checked the numbers again this morning. It was only a hair below that. Um, we saw sort of the similar gap um, between the bison and bald eagles, wolves and grizzly bears in the inner mountain west. I was a little, gun shy, so to speak, on wolves, having done other work on that in the inner mountain west, but we really saw not that big a difference and still half saying that's extremely important. So whether it's predators, although we didn't call them predators, or whether it's, um, you know, non-predator um, species, there was just a really strong identity with those sort of iconic species. Um, migration, I mean, all of these are pretty resonant. The one we, have, where we dropped off a little bit was providing opportunities for trapping, hunting, and fishing. Some people saw this as sort of um, juxtaposed with the idea that when we said refuge, that they thought of safety, um, safety for wildlife especially, that that's something that they thought was a little bit um, discordant in terms, of, in terms of that. And then finally, I'll just add um, shielding fish and wildlife from the impacts of climate change was a little, had more of a partisan edge than many of the others at 64, but it was still 64% saying it was extremely or very important overall. So lots and lots of benefits. That's probably why we saw such amazing support. Um, when you look at it by region on the next slide, the one area that really uh, we saw a real disconnect was on the, the trapping, hunting, and fishing among the Southern California population. It was quite a bit lower than either Florida or the Intermountain West. So um, quite a bit of difference there, but really in most of the other areas, um, other attributes that we tested, there really wasn't a big regional distinction that they were pretty much in line um, and within a few points of each other often for a lot of this, not surprisingly outdoor recreation, like Miranda talked about, was a little bit higher in the Intermountain West just because of those active participation rates there. So um, to really wrap this up and put a little bow on it, um, on the next, you can skip ahead a couple of slides. I just really wanna underscore a lot of what Dave said at the beginning that we see just really overwhelming support for this proposal. People really connect um, refuges to a huge host of benefits, not just for wildlife, but for things that they connect to affecting uh, and impacting people as well, such as water. And that um, they really do feel like we ought to be doing more to help wildlife. Um, and that's the case in all three of these very different regions, um, whether it's Southern California, Florida, or the Intermountain West, there's a real sense that we ought to be doing something and that this is an appropriate and supported proposal. So um, I think if you just move probably up to the QR code on the next slide, that's just in case y'all need to get in touch with us. Um, but this is where you'll be able to find more of the materials. And Rachel, I guess I'll turn it to you or someone else to talk about that. Sure. So um, as Lori mentioned, you can um, scan the QR code or um, type down that, um, that link and you can access our um, news release and a fact sheet that um, emphasizes the key points, um, the key messages that Lori just went over. Um, and feel free to use those. All right, well, thank you so much to Miranda and Dave and Lori for taking the time to walk through all these great results. And um, Katie Arberg from our team at Defenders of Wildlife has shared the link in the chat, but Katie, I'm gonna ask you to send it one more time um, because the chat is long at this point, um, but you can also find the results in the newsroom of our website. 
Um, and we'll, we are recording this and you'll be able to find this soon on our YouTube channel. So um, really appreciate your um, attendance and participation and thank you very much.